some of my favorite sounds growing up was, well, one that you don't hear now too much, um, the sonic boom, the sound of a, a supersonic jet going over. Um, that was a sound that, I guess when I was a kid, they weren't so um, worried about um, sonic boom and the effects on people and the annoyance and stuff and they used, the military would train in our area so you'd hear this quite a lot and that and lawn mowers um, uh, you know being in the summer in a garden and people are mowing their lawns in several um, different lawns in the area that was one of the most influential sounds to me really the, the phase shift and the, the interaction between the different tones and, but I always like things like washing machines and things that just have a certain sound quality to them and 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 sound sound quality to them, to them and Sound quality, sound to quality them. to them. Sound, 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 sound quality to them. Partly modular synthesizers and partly synthesis in general. Um, additive synthesis as well as subtractive synthesis and uh, FM synthesis all different types all of course are totally are totally interrelate and what they have mostly in common is things like the harmonic series and things like this which Delia Derbyshire is um, the person who I learned most about the the, the properties of sound, the way that uh, sounds work, the way, the theory that you can create any sound from an array of sine tones, harmonics. Um, if you can modulate each of these um, sine tones and harmonics in the right way, in theory, you can replicate any sound. I read something about it, Pandavere was saying that you are the, the kind of guy that uh, listens to a sound and then can recreate it in the synthesizer. <laughs> it's true? Ah, wow. Phew. Uh, sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah, that's what I try to do. Uh, usually for sounds, if you, uh, if you have an idea of something that you're trying to get and you understand the way synthesis works. It's not that hard to um, to translate it. I think maybe it's something that I learned from Delia Derbyshire from the Radiophonic Workshop. Yeah. You you knew her. You worked. With I knew her, her and uh, at the end of her life, she was living kind of as a hermit. Actually, I think she lived as a hermit most of her life. Yeah. But at the end of her life, she was living as a, a reclusive hermit totally reclusive hermit um, and I found her somehow different stories no one really remembers exactly how um, but uh, she taught me pretty much everything I know about um, not not so much synthesis I had a fair uh, grounding in yeah. that but in the um, the basis of sound and the way that sound is constructed and the way you know the harmonic series works and I guess she was really one of her uh, big uh, things was mathematics within music yeah. and the patterns and the other thing with manuals is now a lot of people don't give you a manual it's just online yeah and I learned even Pro Tools is, is online it's what I read in the bathroom in the morning, you know, it's, uh, that's, I read manuals for things that I have new and I read them inside out. If I can, I'll even get the manual before I buy the thing and start reading it. 
makes a lot of difference. You can't, yeah. you can't do that with a computer. Another reason why I really like the modular synths was you can create sounds with them for which there is no, there is no pre-existing mind picture. If I play a piano or a guitar, immediately there's this, mind picture of the instrument because we know what it is we know what we recognize that sound but with a synthesizer you can create atmospheres and you can create sounds where all you can do is wonder what the hell could possibly create sound like that you know it's impossible to think it's a box with a load of lights and knobs on it you know and they have uh, and it seems you can create very organic interesting sounds with them. This again, this is without the effect. It has the cow on it. Oh, what's the look? constantly sending out I think what it is is when I started working in studios I want to say eight out of 10 times I would ask people to do things. They would tell me that's not what that's for. And I, I, my, my question would always be, will it break it? <laughs> and the answer was always no. So I was, then it, it's what it's for. We can do that with it. As long as we don't break anything, as long as we don't break anything expensive, <laughs> we can do this. The brain works in a certain way where if something repeats without changing, it discounts it and says, you know this, this has happened. Check someone isn't trying to sneak up on you from behind or, you know, this sort of thing. So I think the, the survival instinct has a real effect on the way that we hear sound. The basic divisions of rock and roll are exact breaks of an octave. So if you have a string that long and you bridge it halfway and make it half as long, it's twice the frequency. If you bridge it a third of the way, I think that's the fifth. So these relationships, these, these divisions of this whole are exactly the same divisions that are used in classical architecture to build rooms. 
So for example, whatever the length is, a third of the length would be the height. Um, half of the length, or half might be the width. So I, I forget the exact correlation, and um, I'm not really interested particularly in following the semantics of it, but they're absolutely related. You know, music is totally um, mathematically describable.